Uh, I'm Pastor Luke. I'm continuing our series in James, and we'll be in chapter two today. <clears throat> yep, chapter two today. And so I encourage you, um, really, I'm praying through this message, and I just felt so strongly that at the end of service, I just wanted to give an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to really speak to us. He doesn't point at us. He doesn't um, convict, or uh, he convicts us. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't shame us, but he does point out things in our lives to help us, to grow us, to heal us. And this morning is a challenge and a sermon really that's about going out, and I wanna give us an opportunity. But I challenge you to come back tonight because I'll be kind of expounding on this theme this morning of how to really love God, and we'll be talking tonight about how to really love your enemy. And so I'm really making that, I wanna make that really a healing time, but also really practical. So I really encourage you to come back out tonight. Um, would you just pray with me as we start? Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that your presence is here. Uh, we thank you that you love us so much. Would you speak to us, Lord, this morning? Speak to every person in here. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Would, would you just, not just move us to a place of knowledge or emotion, but God, that it would move us to a place of action. We love you, Jesus. We also lift up uh, Caleb and Hannah Collins. Their, their boy, Lincoln, needs a touch from you. He needs a touch from you, Lord. Would you just touch him right now, God? Would you provide, would you move in your loving power in their lives? Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in the mighty name that saves. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Collins are just on my heart. I know they're in our bulletin too. Just wanted to shout out them and pray for them specifically for Lincoln. But is anybody a football fan in the room? Football fan? Yes, a couple weeks away from the NFL football. Um, how many of you would describe yourself as like a crazy fan? Crazy fan, crazy-ish? Yeah, crazy, crazy. If there's nobody you can kind of point to about your sports team, it might be you. You might be the, you might be the one. Um, there's some crazy fans. Uh, have you ever looked up like pictures or videos of seeing like crazy sports fans? I looked up some, uh, some NFL, just wanted it to be fitting. Some NFL crazy sports fans, um, and I wanted to show you a couple. So Blake, you can throw that first one. The Bear, any Bears fans in the room? They're not very proud if you are in the room, I don't know. Maybe this year, maybe this year. Next one. Chiefs, any Chiefs fans? I could have I showed a picture of you, Joel. Maybe I should have had you come down with the drum and we could have done a song and dance, crazy. And then my personal favorite, Skull. That's right, the best. Notice how it's the most like intimidating one so far. But I wouldn't leave out any others, so here's the next, some crazy sports fans. You can throw the next one up there. I had to take a shot while I could because the, or the, the Lions are better than us. I'll just admit that publicly. Um, and then my absolute favorite, uh, you can throw that up there. <laughs> Packers fans. You're all crazy. You're all crazy, but we love you still. Uh, I got another picture. This is an old one. A crazy, crazy Baylor fan there. It's kind of a blurry pick. And the lovely Pastor Courtney, crazy Baylor fan. Do you even know who that is, Pastor Weaver, up there? Can you see that? <laughs> deny, deny, deny. You can show the next one, too. He just, he might have fallen there and can't get up. I don't know. There's a lot of crazy sports fans, and, 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 and I was kind of thinking about James 2 and this message, and, and kind of, it, it kind of seems like this two-part uh, or not even two part, just totally different sectioned off if you read the chapter and, and I'll be reading it this morning and uh, I'm kind of gonna start at the end and I'm gonna work my way uh, from the back to the top. And so we're doing that this morning, but uh, it talks about faith and it talks about works, it talks about favoritism and loving people and it's all one united theme as the book is and, and does so well and James writes, but when I think of these crazy sports fans, 
I think I can see them and I know exactly what team that they follow, what team they root for, what team they believe they're gonna win, what team that they're committed to, what they give to. If you didn't know me this morning, if you had no idea, maybe you don't know me. Nice to meet you. You don't know me. If you did not know me this morning and I asked you to guess my team, to guess my favorite NFL team, the one that I follow, the one that I commit to every year, the one that I have the most faith in every year, if I just randomly off the street, if I saw you, it would be a blind guessing game, right? Just listing off teams, you might have some indication based off of, oh, we're in Iowa, maybe it's somewhere around the Midwest, but you wouldn't really know. You wouldn't know what I was feeling on the inside about a certain team unless I showed you, correct? If you came up to me on the street and I was wearing one of these, okay? I was wearing one of these. And I started doing this. Skull, skull, skull. Do you think you could identify what team I like? Steelers. <laughs> we'll pray for your eyesight. My point is this morning is if you, if I didn't show who I followed, you wouldn't know who I followed. In the end of the chapter in James, he's talking about faith. And he's talking about that faith is proven and complete and shown by your works, by your actions. The point is, is us as Christians, if I'm a true follower of Jesus, I commit to him, I believe in him, I have faith in him, I follow him, like a team almost, but even more so, I've given my life to him. If I do not show you that I do that by my actions, by my works, and what James would say, by your love, then you wouldn't know who I followed, would you? And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians in Christianity that is just okay with knowing or following God, but they're not showing that they do. And so how is the world gonna know that we're different? How is the world gonna know that Jesus saves and he heals and he restores and he calls us and he uses us? How does he know, how did the world gonna know that he is worth following if we don't show them? It's not a matter of standard or perfection or earning by any means, and we'll talk about that, but there is an element to if people, if I want people to know who I follow, I have to have them, I have to show them who I follow. It's a public thing. It's a public thing. And what I believe on the inside is shown by how I behave on the outside. People the only way people can know my faith is if I show my faith to them. The outward of my actions shows what's going on on the inside. What I say, what I do, what I look like, what I act like is showing what God is doing. James would say it's, my, it's the evidence of my faith, the proof of my faith, the completing of my faith is in my actions. And James Chapter two, we'll start in verse 14. Uh, it says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and then you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now some may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you do not have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there's one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless. It's useless. A couple months ago I preached on faith and the Holy Spirit gift of faith and I kind of broke down what biblical faith is and so I encourage you, you can go back and watch that because I'm not gonna 
do that whole thing. I have a different direction this morning that James is providing us in chapter two. But overview of this section right here, James gives us three types of faith that we can have as a dead faith that's just simply a belief or a knowledge that only stays in your head. There's a demonic faith that he references that's like the demons because they have a head knowledge. They believe and they are even moved by emotion because they tremble but they don't live it out in their actions. The, the biblical, true biblical faith is dynamic faith that says, I believe, I know, and it moves from my head to my heart and to my hands, and I live it out. That's true, complete, dynamic faith. And I prove, I get to prove what kind of faith that I have by my actions, just like the sports fan. I prove it. I prove it. I also want to say, as a Vikings fan, I believe that we have the most faith out of anybody because there's always next year. <laughs> and then when we start the year, we're going to the Super Bowl and there were a couple games in and we realized we're not, but there's always next year, okay? Dynamic faith, Jake, dynamic faith, okay? So James talks about this concept of proving your faith is real, living it out, it proves and it shows, and he says actions and works and he uses these phrases. I wanna break down, what, what does he mean by that? And if you go to the, it, it, we, we're gonna go back up to the top of the chapter, but here's the connection here for us this morning. In Galatians 5, 6, it says, when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there's no benefit in being circumcised or uncircumcised. Pastor Weaver's gonna preach on that next week. Um, I'm, I'm just kidding, that's a joke. <laughs> what is important is faith expressing itself in love. There's the connection for us. And James gives us perfect example of faith expressing itself in love. These actions, these, these works that he's talking about is love. It's loving others, loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. James, uh, in, in the first verse of chapter two, James makes this direct correlation between works and love and how that works is the love. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? First verse of the chapter, he connects the two thoughts. You can claim whatever you want, but you'll prove to me by your actions. You can claim whatever you want about your faith. You can claim what you want, but it will be shown, it will be proven in how you act. And he even says not just act, but he makes it specific in favoring some people over others. He makes a cor correlation between your relationship with God and your relationship with others. For example, someone, suppose someone who comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Evil motives. He brings it right from this kind of bird's eye view right down to the, to the, the, the nitty gritty, if you will, of it. The rubber meets the road of it. And he gives us a prime example of how we're interacting with people. Do we even show favoritism? Do we have prejudice towards people? And he would say, once again, you can claim what you want about your faith, but it doesn't matter. If you're mistreating people, that shows me how you truly believe. That shows me who you truly follow. That cho shows me your true priorities. And this is not just in James. This is a major theme in the New Testament. Major, major theme, okay? In 1 John, Chapter four, it says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Let me stop there again. Your relationship with God is directly connected to your relationship with others, and vice versa. I cannot love God truly if I do not love God. Others. I cannot know God truly unless I'm loving others. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. He literally says, whoever does not love your brother or sister cannot love God, cannot love God. See, one of the main ways in scripture that I love God is by loving others. That's one of the main ways in scripture. We can ask this question all day as we come into church. We can believe different things as we come into church and go, this is X, Y, Z on how to love God. But the Bible would say the main way that I do that is actually by loving others. It's interesting. It's interesting. If I really want to love God, I actually love others. It shows up in my love, my interaction, my relationships, how I treat people. If I claim to love God, but don't love others, I don't really love God as much as maybe I claim. And the, and the opposite, if I really love God, it will translate into loving others. And I would argue how much you love others reveals, or in James's language, proves or shows how much you love God. Our relationship with God is connected and affected by how we are in relationship with other people. How we treat God is connected and affected on how we treat those around us. See, Jesus himself has, has something to say about this when he is asked, what's the greatest commandment of them all? Give me the biggest one, Jesus, the biggest one, the greatest commandment of all. If you had to tell me one thing, Jesus, tell it to me. And Jesus answers in Matthew 22. He says, uh, or verse 22 verse 37, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally, turn to your neighbor and say equally, equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus answers one question with a two-part response and connects your love for God and your love for others. He said, and this fulfills all of the, all the law. Everything that God wants you to do can be fulfilled in an overview and completed in these two tasks, these two loves, these two works, these two actions. It's impossible to separate your love for God and your love for others, impossible. Jesus continues in Matthew 25, and he, he, he gives a parable about the end times, and he's, he's dividing up the goats and the sheep. The sheep are the believers, and then once he divides those up, he speaks to the sheep, and he says, I, I, I love you, I know you're blessed because you have you, you, you fed me, you, you gave me water to drink, you were a strange, I was a stranger, you showed me hospitality. And in verse 37, the righteous ones will reply, and they say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty or give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and gave you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it for the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You were doing it to me. Jesus is not saying, you are, you're, you're not showing love to people for me. You're actually showing love to me when you show love to people. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that powerful that, that Jesus would say literally the best way that you can love me directly, not indirectly as, oh, I serve God, I wanna do works for him, I, I wanna live my life for God. No, he's saying you wanna do something directly to me and bless me and love on me directly as your king, you love your brothers and sisters. You love your enemies. You love anybody around you. The best way that you can love God is to love people. And there's no, there's no, uh, what's the word? There's no tearing those apart. They are connected with each other. In scripture, I wanna read a couple scriptures to further, further you know, hit this home. Is that all through scripture it talks about that your love for others, your love for people or specific groups of people proves a lot about your life. 
proves, this, 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 it shows who you are. Here's a couple things that what your love for others proves and shows not just the world, but God and shows you. The first one is your love for others proves that you are a disciple of Jesus. In John 13, 34, so now I'm giving you a new commandment, Jesus says, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. You wanna show the world who you are a disciple of? Start loving them like Jesus loves you. It's the second one. Your love proves you are a child of your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 34, you have heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, Jesus is talking, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute, persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. You'll be showing that you truly are a children of the Most High God, a child of the Most High God. The third thing that it proves, your love proves, is that we have truly passed from death to life in Jesus. 1 John 3, 14 through 15. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. Ouch. You know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. He's saying, you wanna prove that God really made you a new creation, that God really made you brand new, that God saved you, he redeemed you, that he gave you abundant life that he talks about? You wanna prove that? It's how you love people. The fourth is your love will prove that God's love is in you. 1 John 3, 16. We know that what we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to love. We, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Is God's love in me? And the last one, your love for others will prove that you belong to the truth of God. I love this because this morning I'm not saying just throw out all truth to love people. Love is the, no, truth in love. Truth in love. Loving people truthfully, okay? And if we truly love people, it shows we actually belong to the truth, capital T, truth. First John 3, dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Belong to the truth. We show it by our actions. We show it by our love. Your love for people proves and shows a lot about your life, about our lives, who we really follow, who we really believe in, who am I committed to? Am I really real about this thing, about my relationship? Have I really been passed from death to life? Lots, it says a lot about me. And I've heard some people firsthand tell me, well, you know, it, when they're being challenged or maybe called out or, 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 or I'm coming to, to come alongside them as a pastor because I see something. And, and I've had people respond to me and say, you can't judge my faith. You, you, you don't know my faith. You don't know my heart. You don't know what's going on in my relationship with God. That's a personal thing. That's a private thing that I'm doing. That's, you can't judge me based off of that. I have a faith. You, you don't know my walk with God. And I would say biblically, yes, I do. Everyone does. Because I can see it. I can see it every single day. I can see your walk with God because of how you walk not just how you talk. That, that, that I know exactly the type of faith that you have. I can see it from afar, not in a judgmental, prejudice, condemning way, but I can look and examine your life and anybody in this room can look and examine each other's lives and go, it's, you're showing me something right now. Whether it's what I'm seeing online or what I just saw from afar of that interaction or I heard about you're showing me a lot of right now about your faith, about your commitment, about your love. And I could see that every day, just basically on how you treat people. 
Christianity and church, we can kind of sometimes have this subconscious or even conscious belief that my relationship with Jesus is a private thing. That's between me and him. That's for my secret place. That's for my quiet time, my getaway, my lonely places. That's what my walk is all about with Jesus. That's how I really love him. It's between me and him. That almost everything really spiritual is private. What's going on in my heart and my thoughts and my life, that's private. That's between me and God. Biblically, that's not true. That's not true. That your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not private. It's meant to be public. Your relationship with Jesus should be personal. He should personally be in relationship with you and you with him. He should personally be impacting your life. He should personally be impacting and moving you to responsibility to follow him personally. But that doesn't stay private. It actually is meant to be public. You're meant to be seen. You're meant to be viewed. You're meant to be examined. You're meant to be. And unfortunately, as Christians, we kind of sign up for this. And it's hard, this is where the rubber meets the road in life of saying, am I truly loving people? Am I truly doing it because the world's gonna see it? I can't fake it. I can't fake it, I can't fake that love. My conduct, my belief is shown, and my convictions, my behavior. Once again, it doesn't as much matter what I say, it matters what I show. What do I show? 1 Corinthians 13 defines what love is. You might only hear this for the most part at a wedding, but it's for everybody. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient, it is kind. Does not je- it's, love is not jealous, it's not boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, it keeps no record of being wronged. That's a hard one. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. What is love? What is this biblical love? Let me tell you, it's not an emotion. It's a decision. It's a decision. Did anything I read there, was that an emotion? These were decisions. They were choices. Choices to love people. Choices to sacrifice on behalf of people. Choices and decisions to serve people. That's why Jesus can command us to love our enemy. He commands us to love in ways that sometimes are not for our benefit. He commands it. He doesn't say feel it, just like that person. No, 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 it's a decision. It's not an emotion that I choose. Am I loving this person? Am I, am I choosing to love this person even when I don't feel like it? How do I show this kind of love? John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. Jesus says, love each other in the same way I have loved you. And 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Can I give you my definition of biblical love or godly love? Godly love is treating others the way that God has treated me. I actually get to love people, I'm empowered to love people, I get the definition of what love is because Jesus loved me first. And he showed me how to do it. He showed me how to love people. That it's not an emotion, that it's a decision. That even in John it says, Jesus says there's no greater love than to lay your life down. How did Jesus love me? He laid his life down in many different ways, not just physically. Romans, Christ loved us while we were still his enemies. He loved us when we were utterly helpless, when we couldn't repay anything that he could offer. It's a sacrificial kind of love, not transactional. What can I get out of this? Jesus loved me when I was utterly helpless, that there's nothing I could even offer him. I could not earn this kind of love. This is the kind of love that Jesus showed us. God has given us things that we don't deserve. That's called grace. And he has not given us things that we do deserve. That's called mercy. This is the kind of love 
that he puts on display and says, not just commands it, but he shows it. He, he proves it to us. He's real about this. It's an unconditional kind of love that whatever condition I'm found in, he still loves me and he has loved me and he's gonna love me. Josiah, could you come for some keys? James, going back to the top of the chapter to bring it back. James in, in, in chapter two, verse eight says, yes, indeed, it's good to love. Uh, it's good when you obey the royal law as found in scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. That's good. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws except for one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. James is literally saying here that the commandment of loving people is not based on a scale. That if I'm loving people enough, it can outweigh maybe my reaction to them, my unforgiveness to that person, my mistreatment and my rudeness. It's not on a scale. He's literally saying you break one of God's laws, you've broken them all. He's making a statement that it's not just if I do more good than bad, then, then I'm okay for this loving people. That's not on the scale that I should judge it. I need to love all people. And it's not just about not harming somebody, then I'm fine. It's as long as I'm not harming that group, but I'm loving this group, I'm fine. That would be an incomplete and disobedience of the commandment to love everybody and not show favoritism to everyone. The Jesus type of love that James references here is not just avoiding doing wrong to somebody, but it's also intentionally doing good to somebody. That I cannot be content just not treating people bad. Does that make sense? That as a Christian, my goal is not just don't treat people bad. My goal actually is intentionally loving people. And I'm not doing good at loving people if I'm just not treating people bad. I'm missing it. I'm missing the intentional action, the pursuit of loving somebody. Christ's love means this intentional action. And if I'm not loving somebody intentionally, then I might be sinning. I might be not completing this commandment. Not doing good is the equivalent of doing evil when it comes to love. Not doing good. I know what I should do, but I don't. You remember that from scripture? I know what I ought to be doing and I don't. That's a sin. And James specifically, when he talks about treating people in favoritism, he isn't even referencing treating people badly. He's just referencing treating people differently. So once again, it's not just, oh, I, I, just, I just don't treat people bad. Am I treating people differently than the, those that I really love? Because that would be favoritism. That would be a sin. So when I ask the question in my life, am I treating that person badly? That's the wrong, is he, or it's easy to answer that. No, I'm not treating them bad. I'm not treating them wrong, and I think I'm good. And I think maybe I'm obeying the commandment because I'm not mistreating people. But the correct question that I need to ask is, am I treating them differently than I treat other people? He gets specific on us. He gets challenging. It's not just about loving some people. It's about loving all people, all people. If we really love God and we really want to love God, we need to love all people. We need to love all people. Intentionally reaching out, intentionally pursuing, intentionally sacrificing, intentionally going after these people. Not just some, not just the easy, not just the like me kind of people, but everybody. And it's not a love that I just walk around hoping that God presents an opportunity. It's a love that says, I'm pursuing, I'm looking. How can I love somebody today? How can I be a neighbor to somebody today? Not just sitting back asking, Who's, who is my neighbor? Who should I be loving? No, I, I'm asking, who can I be a neighbor to today? That makes sense? Jesus pursued me. He pursued you. He gave us the fullness of his life, that he lived a perfect life, that I didn't deserve one ounce of that sacrifice, and he gave it all to me. 
And that shouldn't stop with me as a Christian. That actually flows through me and empowers me to love others like Jesus did. He gave me the example. He gave me the playbook. Is it easy? No. Is it hard? Yeah. Sometimes it's really hard. But is it a commandment? Yes. Do I really want to love God? I need to love people. If I I want to show my faith is real, then I need to love all people. I can't just say it. I can't just agree with it. I can't just be moved to emotion. Yeah, yeah, I need to do that. I need to go and do it. I need to go and do it. And I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that empowers us and fills us us with this kind of love because this is not a human kind of love. I don't conjure this thing up. I can't love my enemy. What are you talking about? I need Jesus for that. That's why I'm, I'm reminded all the time of how Jesus has loved me and that helps me and empowers me to love people. Would you stand all across the room? I just want to give you a moment. I want to give you a moment and we're going to end after this. We're not going to go into a song. I want to ask you a couple questions and once again, hopefully allow the Holy Spirit just to speak to your heart and your mind. So if you bow your heads, nobody looking around, it's just an opportunity to get focused in, hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in your heart and your mind. Most likely, he's probably already been speaking to you about some people maybe putting faces to your mind's eye, tugging at your heartstrings a little bit. Put it into context, the question that I I don't want you to ask this morning is, do I love people? This is a bad question. The right question is, how have I been loving people? Have I been doing it? Because that'll prove to me if I love people or not. So ask this question to yourself. Have I been loving people? What is my love for others revealing about my faith in God. What is my love for others revealing about my love for God? What's what's it showing me? In what ways have I been loving people like Jesus has loved me? is the Holy Spirit showing me that I need to love like Jesus? Maybe it is an enemy. Maybe it is somebody that hurt you. Or maybe it's somebody in close proximity. A, a literal neighbor. A literal co-worker. Maybe it's somebody that doesn't look like you at all. Not from the same background, belief, view system, worldview. Maybe that's the person. That is the person. Who is it? And what is something that I can do to love them like Jesus loves me? Let's make it practical here. Let's not just move heartstrings. Let's get a plan. How can I love them? How can I go out of my way to love them? If you're in the room and you're visiting, maybe you don't have this relationship with God. You don't fully know how much God has loved you. Maybe ask the Holy Spirit who's in the room and wants to speak to your heart. What has Jesus done to love me? It's a whole lot. And it continues to be a whole lot. And if you want to respond to that love by giving him your life, so you can have that abundant life. I want to just pray over you. Would you just raise your hand? That's you, so I can just pray with you. Yeah, I see your hand. Thank you for responding. Thank you, God, for your great love. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. See the hand. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love. The perfect love, God, that pursued us first. The perfect love that died on a cross for our sins that took the penalty that we racked up, the payment that that, that we needed, that we could never pay, we could never earn, but God, you gave it to us because you love us and you created us. 
Thank you for these hands going up as a sign and a symbol of them giving their lives to you, saying, I want that abundant life. And thank you, God, that now that you have not just set them free, you've not just made them a new creation, but you've adopted them into your family as sons and daughters. So we thank you, God, for that. God, we pray for everybody else in the room that would say today, I love God, I have faith in God. I pray that you would empower us in a new way, in a new level to step out and show that, not just to our brothers and sisters, but to the world. God, that this would be a new army across even Des Moines of of people really seeing how Jesus is alive because we are showing them how he loves people and how they can love you, God. I pray that you would just fill us up with your Holy Spirit because this is hard. But thank you that you went through it. You gave us the perfect example and you walk right there with us. God, thank you for the opportunities that not, we're just not gonna look for, but we're gonna create to love people. Thank you, God, for the real faith that I know is in this room, for the real love for you that is in this room. God, I thank you for the ones that, that have been showing this. God, would you continue to give them people, continue to give us people the love, Lord, and help us every step of the way. We thank you, God, that you empower us, that you fill us up. I pray, Lord, this would not just be a a, a new head knowledge. It would not just be something that moves my heart or convicts me. But, God, it would truly be something that I start the second I get out of the pew, the second I leave the lobby, the second I go to lunch today, that I would intentionally, sacrificially love people, love those around me. Help us, God. And we thank you and we celebrate all that you've done for us. As we sang this morning, let us never forget the love that you shed, the the, the love that you proved. Let us never forget that, God, because that is such a vital piece for us living out this love is never forgetting what you've done. We thank you for that love, God. We thank you for all that you're doing and you're going to do. We thank you for the many people that are going to come to faith in you because they're seeing true love on display. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that we get to partner with you to reach the people that you love. We love you, Lord. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Let's go do it, church. Come on, let's go love people. Let's go be the hands and feet of Jesus. Come back tonight. We're gonna expound a little bit on loving your enemy and that that kind of tension there. Be blessed, we love you.